Hi guys, welcome to another Saturday of Exploration Saturdays. And today we have holidays on the trail. So we're gonna talk a little bit about what Lewis and Clark did to celebrate the holidays. And then afterwards, I'm gonna show you how you can make your own holiday wreath. And then the second part of this video, I'm gonna show you how to make some snow candy. That's a recipe from about the 1800s. Now, Lewis and Clark, they did celebrate Christmas. They celebrated it three times during the expedition. So that was three winters. Their first time was outside St. Outside St. Louis, that's when they were at Fort Dubois. That was their winter camp when they were getting ready to go on the expedition. Then they set sail and they reached North Dakota in the winter of 1804. There they had Fort Mandan. That was their second Christmas. And then of course they continued west all the way to the Pacific coast. That's where they had Fort Clatsop and that's where they had their third winter. Now, if you were one of the crew with Lewis and Clark, usually you would start Christmas morning with a Christmas shout and salute. So with the salute, all you guys would grab your muskets and you'd uh, fire around into the air as a mark of celebration. They even had a swivel cannon that they would fire just for fun, just kind of like fireworks that we have on 4th of July. So they would fire and have a salute of gunfire. And then a Christmas shout was when they would go outside the captain's cabin and they would wish them Merry Christmas or they would say Christmas gift. Now, have you ever heard of a Christmas shout? That's kind of originated in one of the southern states. And a Christmas shout, you know, wishing someone a Merry Christmas or shouting Christmas gift, that is something you would do so that the other person would have to give you a gift then. So you're the first one to give a Christmas shout, you know, wish them a Merry Christmas or yell Christmas gift. The other person had to give you a gift if you were the first one to say that. So something you might wanna try maybe with your parents or a sibling, you know, give them a Christmas shout. And if you beat them to it, they have to give you a gift. So that's usually how your mornings would start. Then they would hand out, um, probably have some food, some drinks. In the afternoon, the men would say they would go hunting all day. They love to go hunting. In the evening times, they might have a dance with music and singing. And then oftentimes too, they did exchange gifts. Now we don't know what the soldiers received, except for the one time when they were at Camp Fort Mandan, the captain said they handed out rolls of tobacco and handkerchiefs to the soldiers. Now for the captains, we do know what they got for Christmas when they were over on the Pacific coast on Fort Classip. Captain Lewis says he got some socks and Captain Clark said he got received some weasel tails from Sacagawea. And so they do talk a little bit what, about what they received, you know, socks, pants, some weasel tails, a basket. There was an exchange of food, but it's not gifts that we received today. It's completely different from today where you might receive a game or an Xbox or a doll. So their gifts were a little bit different and really they were giving what they had available and really it was that intention that was really important. They gave it with their best wishes, you know, and socks at that time were pretty important. They had worn through all their socks. They had to quickly knit new ones. And so to give a gift of socks to keep your feet warm in the winter was a really nice gift. And then we have one meal that they, we know of one meal they definitely had on a Christmas night. It was at Fort Clapsip on the Pacific coast. We know they had spoiled elk meat, fish, and some roots. So not the best Christmas dinner. They really were struggling for food at that time, but we do know one of the soldiers, they did write, we are mostly in good health, a blessing which we esteem more than all the luxuries this life can afford. And that was from the soldier White House. So even though they didn't have very much to eat, even though they didn't have all these huge gifts to give to each other, they were still really thankful that they were still all together, that they're healthy, that they had a roof over their heads, and that they were all together and that they could spend that time together. So even though they didn't have much, they still had a really wonderful day with hunting and dancing and music and singing. Now to celebrate with Lewis and Clark, one of the things they probably celebrated and did back home when they were home in the US was decorate with evergreens. 
So I have an evergreen wreath right here. And with these, these were really popular at the time because evergreens, if you ever see, you know, Christmas trees or holly or mistletoe, those things stay green all year long. So back then, it was a really perfect thing to decorate to bring this pop of color into your home because it was already green, it stays green, and it was a great thing to decorate. And so right now, if you were to go do a little shopping, a lot of this uh, holiday decorations already on sale. You know, stores, they're already putting out stuff for 4th of July. Just kidding, that was a joke. But if you happen to be shopping, I definitely recommend picking up some evergreen, maybe a wreath, maybe some branches. Because people in the early 1800s, that's what they usually decorated with for the holidays. They would put it in windows, on doors, because it's something they had available and it was always green. And so if you find some of these in the store, I found one with little pine cones that you could easily glue to your wreath. Now my pine cones, I saw that they were just the brown pine cones and I wanted to put a little snow on them. So if you find some pine cones and you wanna put a little pretend snow on your pine cones, all you do, you grab a little bit of glue. I have glue in this cup here. I just grabbed a paintbrush and basically you're gonna paint your pine cone with a little bit of glue all over there in the corners. And then to have snow that's gonna last all year long, run to your kitchen cupboards, or walk, don't run, and grab your baking soda. Cause if you ever cooked with baking soda, it kinda looks just like snow. And I'm gonna paint a little bit more on there. And then I have a little bit of baking soda right over here in this cup and then you just sprinkle it on your pine cone and then you let that dry and then it looks like you have snow on your pine cone. There we go, shake off a little extra. And you can do that with all your pine cones if you want them to look like they have snow on it. You also, back then, they would also decorate their wreaths. Might seem a little weird, but with nuts and fruits, because at the time, that's what they had. There really wasn't a market for holiday decorations back then yet. It was very much, you know, an at-home event with friends and family, but they would maybe have some walnuts or candy fruit that they would decorate with. And I'm just gonna add some of mine right here into my wreath. Now, something I have here on my table that Lewis and Clark would not have been familiar with was those poinsettia flowers that we see all over the place in the store. Now the poinsettia flowers, they didn't come around until after Lewis and Clark. These flowers grow in Central America, in like Mexico, and they love that warm climate. So it wasn't until later, in about, I wanna say early 1900s, that we started decorating with the poinsettias and the really beautiful flowers. And so you can decorate though with those two. I'm gonna add one right here. And with these wreaths, you know you can clip them onto your wreath, you can glue them on, however you wanna decorate your wreath. And then this one I think I might set on my door because that's where Lewis and Clark may have put a wreath. Who knows, maybe they did have a wreath that they found in the forest, especially when they're along the Pacific coast that they took and decorated the doors with. They don't mention that, but they could have. Now that's a very fun project to do, you know, especially when everything goes on Christmas sales. Another activity you can do is do a Christmas wreath of traditions. And this you simply make out of different colors, paper that you can color and add details to. And so just like Lewis and Clark, just like today, Lots of families have their own traditions, how they decorate, what maybe what kind of ornaments they put on their tree or on a wreath. So to make a paper wreath, all you do, it's really easy. You grab some green construction paper, you cut out some leaves, those little round leaves. And since evergreens are usually needles, those are kind of hard to cut out, these really pokey needles, I just like to draw little needles onto my leaf here. And you cut out a whole bunch of these little leaves for your wreath. And then all you do when you're ready to glue them all together, you just glue them into a circle. You get a whole bunch of leaves and you just glue them in place. 
and you want them to overlap just a little bit. And then the next thing I want you to do is to cut out different traditions that you celebrate, maybe that your friends celebrate, different traditions that you might have heard of. So for example, I have a little holly right here. And this is really popular around the holidays, again, because holly stays green all year round. So those are those red berries with leaves. I'm gonna add that to my tradition wreath. I know a lot of people who love to decorate that. Another one that's really popular is the mistletoe. Now I always thought for some reason mistletoe had red berries, but they're actually white. And this is a very common thing you see in Western Europe. That was a very common tradition to you know, hang up mistletoe where you kiss underneath the mistletoe. Another one you might be familiar with is the Yule log. This is actually from Scandinavia, where they would, back in the days before we had central heating, you would cut down trees and logs to keep your house warm. And around the Christmas time, you would cut down, you know, the prettiest tree you could find. You would save a log, the best log there was, and you would burn this for 12 days of Christmas. And then you would save the ash and the embers that were left over from that 12 days and you would use that ash to light your next Christmas fire for next year with a whole new Yule log. So I had a little Yule log to my tradition wreath. Another thing you might see, say you're in Britain, is the Christmas cracker. And a Christmas cracker kind of looks like a wrap candy and you would pull the wrapper apart. It kind of makes a popping noise and it would be filled with candy or toys which I think is a really fun tradition to get a Christmas cracker that's full of yummy things to eat. Another thing that I had when I was growing up was the Christmas pickle. And this one originated over in Germany. And basically it's an ornament that looks like a pickle. The parents would hide it in the tree and whoever woke up the next morning, you know, a brother or sister, whoever found it first, found the Christmas pickle in the tree would get an extra gift. So there's some incentive there. So I'm gonna add that to my wreath of traditions. Another one from Holland was the wooden shoes. Doesn't look like much like a shoe, but I cut out a shoe. Use your imagination. And in Holland and um, over there, they would put out wooden shoes for Santa to fill with gifts. So that's another tradition, putting out your wooden shoes. And of course, I didn't cut out a poinsettia yet, but I can easily, with my construction paper, I'm gonna cut out a poinsettia to add to my wreath of traditions because that's also really common flowers that we find that grew down in Central America. They've grown to be very popular all over the world as a Christmas decoration. And that's a whole new tradition that came around from the 1900s. And it's easy to do. You just cut out more petals from your construction paper glue those all together, and I'll add that to my tradition wreath of traditions. And so that's really easy to do at home. All you need is construction paper, glue, scissors. I use color pencils to ex add extra details to all my different traditions that I added to my wreath. It's just a fun thing to do on a Saturday morning, maybe when it's snowing outside. Now stay tuned for part two when we, I am going to teach you how to make snow candy. Hi guys, welcome to part two where we're going to make some snow candy. So we're in the kitchen of the Lewis and Clark Interpretive Center and your snow candy is really simple. You need two ingredients. You need sugar, brown sugar to be more precise, and molasses. And this was a really fun recipe for kids to make in the early 1800s. Because in the early 1800s, you would have molasses in your kitchen much more then than you do today. So you'd be cooking with molasses a lot more often back in the 1800s because white sugar, which is what we mostly use today, was really expensive. White sugar you first starts as brown sugar and then it's refined, taking out all that molasses until brown sugar becomes white sugar. So basically, white sugar is brown sugar without molasses. But that process was expensive, so not many people had white sugar in their kitchens back then. 
But this will be a really fun treat to make on a winter day. All you need is molasses, you need sugar, you need ice, which I have here. There we go. You're going to want to use crushed ice, or if you want a real frontier experience, you're going to pack down some snow into a tray. But we don't have any snow yet, so I use crushed ice, really small, really fine. I've already washed my hands, so make sure you wash your hands. And I'm just going to pack back down like it was snow and make basically a little bed of snow crushed ice right there. And basically what we're going to do, we're going to boil our sugar, our molasses, and our brown sugar together until it boils. We're going to lay it on that bed of ice. It'll harden into like a taffy and then you can eat it. So if you like taffy, you like caramel, it's a really sticky, yummy treat to eat. Now, since we are boiling sugar, I recommend doing this with your parents. Absolutely do it with adults because boiling sugar can be very dangerous. You don't want to touch it at all because boiling sugar is kind of risky. So definitely do this recipe with an adult, but it's a one-to-one -one ratio. So I'm going to use a third of a cup of brown sugar and put that in my pan. Got a third of a cup brown sugar. I'm going to do a third of a cup molasses. There we go. Makes a pretty good amount. Looks like I might use up the whole jar there. And basically you're going to stir this all together and when you're boiling sugar, you basically have to keep boiling it. Never stop stirring. And so I'm going to turn this on a low heat here to begin with. I would recommend using a wooden spoon. I have a spatula that I'm going to use today. And for now, for about five to 10 minutes, we're just going to stir this all together until it boils. Now, if you have a candy thermometer, you can use that. You want it to get to that mm. cracking point on your thermometer. But if you're like me, who doesn't have a candy thermometer, grab a cup of water. You know after you've got your sugar all boiled together and you're going to take a piece of it, we're going to plop it into the water. And if it holds this shape, if it holds this shape as a ball, then we know it's ready to pour on our bed of ice. But if it mixes with the water, then we know it's not ready yet. And so that's all you have to do. You're going to stir it. I started on a low heat. I'm going to go up to a medium heat, so about four to five if your oven has numbers. And that's all you do. You're just going to keep stirring. But remember, do this with your parents or your aunt, uncle, grandparents because working with hot sugar can be really dangerous because you don't want to touch it. And so just nice, slow, easy stirring. And basically that's what we're going to do for the next five minutes. All right guys, we've been stirring for about five minutes now. Now remember, take it nice and easy when you're stirring that hot sugar. You do not want it to splash. If you've never used molasses before, I think it smells kind of nice. It has a nice little smell to it and it kind of will taste the way it smells. Now because I don't have a candy thermometer, I'm just going to drop a little bit of this boiling sugar. So I've just got it to a point where it's just starting to make little bubbles, a little sizzling on the bottom of the pan. It has this nice really dark caramel color to it. And so I'm going to drop just a little bit into a cup of cold water. And if it holds this shape, then I know it's ready to pour on my bed of snow. So I'm just going to take a little bit really quickly and it's holding its shape so it didn't dissolve into the water. And so, because if you look on the bottom of that water, you can actually see where it kind of looks like a little worm there on the bottom, which doesn't sound very appetizing. So that means my sugar is ready to go. Now remember, this is very hot. You do not want to touch it. So I would recommend when you pour it onto your packed snow here, you use a spoon. I have a ladle that I'm going to use. So I'm going to take this off of heat. Be very careful so that sugar doesn't, you know, go flying everywhere. And then I'm just going to grab my little ladle spoon here and I'm going to pour it out on my bed of ice and I'm going to make little fun shapes. There we go. 
Now I'm gonna give this a little stir really carefully because I don't want it to burn on the bottom. But with our bed of ice over here, carefully put that back in there. I have a popsicle stick I'm gonna use to kind of pick it up. It should be pretty cool by now, but as you can see, as I pick it up, because I wanna be extra cautious, it's actually held its shape pretty well. And there we go. So I have a very long train of candy snow. Now, if this recipe sounds familiar, if you ever read the Little House on the Prairie books, this is one of the recipes they did on one winter cold winter morning for Christmas. So it was a really fun recipe to have on the frontier. It was a really good treat too because at that time sugar was so expensive. When you got sugar, it was a really special treat. And of course, back then, having molasses in the kitchen was much more common than it is today because back then it was still imported from the West Indies and of course sailing it across the ocean was kind of expensive. So if you wanted to buy that nice refined white sugar, you had to pay a lot of money for that. But molasses was a little bit more cheaper and there's a whole nother strip right there. So guys, you can repeat this as much as you want. Give it a taste. Now remember, we don't eat molasses much anymore, so the taste might be a little bit unusual, but I say give it a go, keep an open mind. And it's just like a really sticky caramel, so I think it's a really fun winter treat to try one day. Let me know how it goes, Send or ask questions in the comments below, post pictures of your snow candy, and I will see you next time. Thanks guys.